You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 36. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm Katie Wardrobe, a music technology education trainer, speaker and consultant from midnightmusic.com.au where I help music teachers use technology effectively in music education. In this episode, I talk with Dr. Scott Watson. He's a fantastic music educator and composer from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Scott's been incorporating technology into his music teaching for many years and he takes a project-based learning approach when it comes to creative music assignments with his elective students. He also uses technology on a daily basis for his own composition work. In this episode, we talk about how he got started with technology and how he accidentally, in inverted commas, ended up incorporating key education learning trends such as blended learning, flipped classroom and project-based learning into his teaching. Now, during the episode, we mentioned a number of videos and resources and other useful and interesting things. And as usual, you can find the links to all of the things that we talk about on the show notes page for this episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 36. Today, my guest is Dr. Scott Watson. Scott has just entered his 31st year of teaching instrumental and elective music in the Parkland School District in Allentown, Pennsylvania. He's a prolific composer with more than 70 published works for band and orchestra at all levels and is an advocate for using technology in music learning to encourage student creativity. He's so passionate about it that he wrote a book on the topic titled Using Technology to Unlock Musical Creativity. Scott also teaches undergraduate and graduate music courses as an adjunct professor for several area universities. Scott's family is very musical. His wife, daughter and son are all music educators, so music definitely runs in the family. So welcome, Scott, to the podcast. Thank you, Katie. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Scott's just told me he's got a bit of a cold coming down from a cold, so cough, uh, cough lozenges are in the mix here today, so it's all yeah, good. Yeah, I apologise. Sorry about that. <laughs> So yeah, I have a musical family too. It's much the same. My, my both of my parents are music educators. My brother and I are both musicians. I've I've stuck with the education area. Uh, my brother's a great drummer um, and also makes good coffee too. He runs a coffee business, so <laughs> yeah, it's That's a really perfect. useful thing. Useful thing for musicians. <laughs> the family that plays together stays together. Exactly. I always say. <laughs> yeah. And did you do that? Because we, as a family, we often ended up playing together. In um, both of my parents are involved in musicals, and so. Uh -huh. We often had, you know, the family band was in the pit, you know, very small yep. sort of community um, um, events and stuff, but lots of fun. We used to have lots of fun uh, doing that together. I used, I used to tell my wife when we first started our family that nothing would make me happier than when my family could sing in solfege in four parts. Yes, awesome. And that's what happened. <laughs> At yes. some point, we were able to, my wife would sing soprano, my daughter the alto, yes. my son the tenor, and I would sing the bass, and I mean, it's just total theory geek. Um, <laughs> But I just love that we were able to do that. <laughs> I, I actually remember doing that as well as a kid because uh, we were all singers too, choral background. And uh, my dad said to, because when we were young, we all from England and so came out to Australia when we were young. I think I was about, I must have been about maybe six or seven or so and my dad decided that we should record a cassette tape for people back oh. in England and so we actually recorded um, I think it was happy birthday for my great aunt whose birthday's around Christmas time and so we we recorded in four parts so my my parents sang I think my mum sang the the tenor part and because my brother and I were really young at the time so mm -hmm. um, dad sang bass and uh, I sang alto and my brother sang soprano and yeah I, I wish we had a copy of that recording it would have been great <laughs> yeah. yeah, and my son is a very good um, pianist, and he's an organist actually. Um, so he accompanies whoever's playing too. So we have a built-in yeah. built-in accompanist. Yep, yep. <laughs> as as both my parents are too. It's great. It's so mm. useful. Excellent. So um, I mean, we we were lucky to meet a few years ago, which is great. I, I can't believe actually how long ago it is now. I, I just read, you know, the the title of your book, and you had put the year of publication being two thousand and eleven, and I thought, mm -hmm. okay, that. 
that's actually quite a long time ago. I remember when it came out and, you know, had right. a copy and it was great. And, and I guess around that time was when we met. Was that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was 2013. It was 2013. And this just sort of demonstrates how small the world is because of um, technology. Because yeah. I think we had started following each other on Twitter maybe. Yeah. And um, next thing you know, we were talking about the MTech conference, which you were very involved in. And, uh, but that was 2013. Uh, so that was a couple of years after the book was out. That's crazy. Um, that we, we got to meet in, in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, that, and that was, was a fantastic trip. I loved coming there. I loved meeting you. And, and there was a great conference. Yeah, um, I wish but, that was But still that was going. all because of the internet. Like it we was. hadn't met in person until yeah. the, the actual conference. <laughs> I and I loved that conference because I, I basically chose keynote speakers for a few years and I just picked people I wanted to meet <laughs> from my <laughs> so, so there was you, no, there was James and yeah, Amy Burns and uh, and Barbara Friedman. They all got to come out and it was yeah, it was a great time. Such a great conference. Um, music technology focused completely and um, it, you know, everyone was sort of in their element, those of us who were really loving it at the time. Right. So, so when did you start with technology and teaching? Was it around from an early time? I mean, I know some of the other people I've spoken to, they, they started out really early with synthesizers and all sorts of things. And I, that right. wasn't my personal experience at all. But, you know, what, what was yours like? Well, so what, ever since I started teaching, I was in graduate school right before my first year of teaching, uh, getting my master's degree. And then shortly after I started teaching, I went back for my doctorate. And in that program uh, in graduate school at Temple University in Philadelphia, I was using a lot of technology, both DAWs and um, notation software. Finale and, and Digital Performer were the two that we were using. And I was producing my music. Um, I was doing a lot of writing um, for um, you know chamber groups on campus and and um, collegiate groups. And I, I did some um, theater, um, you know, incidental music in Philadelphia. I did a lot of commercial. I did some. I worked for a software company. I wrote some. So I was doing basically a lot of commercial and concert art music outside of school. But inside of school, yeah. the only reason I used technology would be to create stuff for students, like to create a warm up sheet or to create a, te a test or a worksheet. And it wasn't until I'd been teaching about 15 or 16 years, somehow the, 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 the light snapped on. And I just, it, I guess what it was is, I think it was I was taking a class in film scoring at Temple, on one of these grad classes, where I was up like three hours every night working on a different cue for, for a project. And my wife, um, I think it was like three in the morning, my wife's like, aren't you coming to bed? And I was like, <laughs> yeah, as soon as I finished this cue. And it wasn't that I was tired. I was digging it. I was really enjoying the work. <laughs> and I think it was about then, the, that was like, say, 2000 or 1999 or something. Um, now, maybe it was a little earlier, but I, I thought to myself, gosh, if I am willing to stay up late into the early morning <laughs> working on this, I bet your kids would like to do uh, creative projects like this. Yeah, and, absolutely. And that was like a, a, a complete 180 pivot in all the te in the kind of elective music classes I teach um, away from content and towards creativity. Yeah, I, I think the same too. I, it's when you get into that zone and um, I was saying to a group of, of university students, I, did, I ran a, a sort of a, a three-hour lecture thing last week. It was like a workshop on just some introductory stuff with technology and things you can do and, and I said to them the best thing you can do is go and create set yourself a project so go and create um, just a cover version even in GarageBand on the iPad or whichever you know it wasn't software specific and whichever thing you've got handy you know just go and create it because you'll find that when you start doing it it's lots of fun <laughs> like you can really enjoy right. it and that, that's how I learned I decided right I'm going to just set myself a little task a project and and you have to learn what it is that you're doing you have to learn all the steps in the software and but you want to because you're motivated at that point. I think that's actually a great um, um, pedagogical principle is that, you know, the, uh, the saying about when the, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, that kind of thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so like if you're, um, if you're teaching students, um, say, um, you, say one approach would be, I'm going to teach them how to use Finale. And I'm going to teach them every conceivable thing they might ever want to do, like how to put in triplets. But they'll forget all that. Yeah, the only thing care. they'll remember is the thing that they need to do the project that they're motivated to create. Yeah. So now my, my thing is I'm going to teach you a minimal set of things just to get you to use the software because it's not really about the software. Uh, once I get you creating and now you might be writing a piece and you say, well, Dr. Watson, I want to do dun, 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 dun. How do I put that in? Oh, those are triplets. 
and then I'll, yeah. then, I'll tell, then you'll remember it because you care about it because there's a reason. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've mentioned on the another episode maybe that I had to do some harp notation in Sibelius at one point, and I, I was also around that time presenting at the harp convention in Australia, right. which which there was, and yeah, I learned intimately how to do harp notation at the time, you know, pedaling and stuff like that. Do do I know it now? Could I tell you no? <laughs> because uh-huh. I just don't need to do it now. So, but at the time I was like this expert. It was great. Sure. <laughs> and so do you think, has it changed over time? In those early days, actually, just getting back to, you know, you were doing the film queue and, and that sort of right. thing. So at, with the students at that time, were you doing film scoring? And is that what you started no. off with? Okay, it was something no. else. In fact, um, there was a class that I was asked to teach um, some elect. So, so I, I had been a high school band director. When I went back to school for my doctorate, I actually changed to do elementary, like first and second year band, so that I would be free in the afternoon to go take classes, <laughs> uh, my graduate classes. But then after a few years, um, the district asked me if I could uh, come back to the high school for part of the day, which is what I do now. I teach elective classes in the morning, like music production um, and music theory levels, uh, things like that. So at first, when I started those elective classes, I called it music technology. And it was just two things. For half the uh, semester, we learned how to use Finale. And for the other half (laughs) of the semester, we learned how to use Digital Performer. And in both cases, it was kind of like... We spent weeks and weeks and weeks learning to use the program, and then we went on to the next program. Whereas, <laughs> so that, so the, the big pivot or the change over time is that now I would rather use a program like NoteFlight, which is a lot easier to use at first, or a program like GarageBand, which is a lot easier to use at first. Um, get kids creating. Uh, and, and I'm not so much concerned with um, telling them how to operate a program as um, some good principles for music making. So um, like a, a way to uh, an approach to orchestration or an approach to a narrative style of, of, of how a song unfolds so the listener will care about listening it. So we're really actually talking mostly in my classes about creating great music and we're listening to, to great music by, you know, whether it's in pop or jazz or classical, we're listening to great examples. We're analyzing it. We're trying to make it happen with the software we use, but the software is so much easier to use now. Um, and then there is a point like right now, um, we're what five or six weeks into the year. I already have students in my music theory class asking me about finale. Like they've used notation software note flight for a few projects and now they want to do something a little more expressive and they do need to jump over to finale to do it. Um, and that's sort of what will happen with um, GarageBand. They could go to a DAW uh, that's more sophisticated. But I really don't make the classes as much about the software as about the musical principles I'm trying to teach. And um, that's why I like uh, programs like GarageBand that are so accessible and, and note flight. Yeah, I think so too. And, and I think the, um, you know, with YouTube and ac- accessibility to lots of online tutorials, there's any number of other ways they can get the information about how to use the software. And I'm always saying, you know, music teachers are saying to me in workshops, why do I need to teach them about this? Because they can just go and find answers on YouTube. And I'm like, well, they can about the software, but your superpower is being the music teacher and to encourage their creativity and the compositional aspects and teach them about form and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's a great way. And they can, you know, you can even sort of set assignments, particularly well, older students. It's like, just go and do this thing in the software and you need to figure out how how to do that in the software, how to add a track, how to record right. a voice part and, and all of that stuff. And they can do that part on their own. So it's good. It's good to have that sort of, uh, yeah, opportunity to do the learning themselves in some right. regards. But I think it's great. And so um, the project-based approach, I mean, I know in your book, which is fabulous, um, you and Barbara both have great books, which are both really project-based. And um, you. they you know, things that <clears throat> the sorts of projects that I often are doing with uh, people in workshops and, and that sort of thing. And um, have has that been always the case? How did they develop over time, those projects? Did you test something out and then... You you know, got well, there is a lot of trial and error. And I will say, too, um, both my graduate degrees are um, my, my master's and my doctorate are in um, composition. Yes. So that's 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 what I wanted to go further with um, in graduate school. But it sure has helped, um, I think, um, in sort of my approach to like looking analytic, analytically at music and having kids reflect about what they're hearing and trying to observe what are these things that are happening in in music of lasting worth. They do this and they do this. So let's try to do it in our project. So that that's maybe my strength. But my my weakness would be the educational jargon. So I have to tell you, <laughs> 
I had to like, like through years and years of trial and error and hard um, earned experience, like even come up with the idea of project based learning. And I was doing it before I even knew what the term project based learning was. I just knew that this was better in terms of motivating kids and having the learning make a difference and having it stick um, than it was if I was doing another way. And like, so I would go to a conference and hear somebody talk about uh, constructivist theory. And I'd be like, hey, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm doing. I guess I'm constructivist. And then I'd hear somebody else say project-based learning, PBL. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm doing project-based learning. And, and, and those things that they use in project-based learning, like uh, refining and um, exhibition at the end, like have a little recital. Like I've been doing that. I just didn't know it was called that. You know? yeah. so, and I, um, think, um, was... I think in music it happens naturally. I remember James Humberstone, who was at that same conference you know, that you sure. came out for, um, he... He and I have always talked about this, you know, idea of project-based learning and before it was a thing as well. And and I remember him saying in, I think, a keynote uh, speech that he was delivering, we do it in music anyway, because as soon as you say, I want to learn a song, that's like project-based learning because you go, I right. need to learn the song. And then suddenly you're learning all of the chords that make up the song or the, you know, you're reading the sheet music or whatever it is. And, and it just happens so naturally, I think, anyway. And the performance yep. aspect, yeah. So I think it's great. But yes, I'm, I'm the same, actually. I try to keep up with the jargon, even though we're all doing it anyway. You kind of need to put labels on it so that other people recognize what you're doing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you had you. Uh, but by the way, I love your podcast. I'm a fan of it. Oh, and um, <laughs> in, in, a, in a recent episode, you you had a, a gentleman on talking about the, um, uh, what I would call blended learning, or he's putting up uh, movies, he's creating tutorials, videos, um, yeah, and, great. and, and yeah. that whole podcast was about that. And so again, I had been doing that. Um, first, I was using. Um, uh, now I'm using Camtasia. What's the one that you use? Um, the uh, Mac screen only flow. One? Screen flow. Yeah, screen yes. flow. I do screen flow for years. I just about a year ago switched over to Camtasia. So, um, but now I call it blended learning, right? So, <laughs> so the, these, these videos that I've been putting up that, that help kids go home and figure it out if they didn't get it in class or if I didn't have time to teach it in class or maybe it's something that I didn't think was important enough to take class time with because class time is mostly me coaching students and working with them in smaller groups and little one-on-one -on -one conferencing and stuff. And that's all part of the PBL. But um, but yeah, so blended learning is another thing. I, yeah. I didn't realize I was doing it until somebody mentioned, hey, that's blended learning. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. You can tick another box off. <laughs> right, right, and right. It's funny. I um, often show an example of yours, actually. Uh, when I do iPad workshops, you know, we talk about the fact that you can use apps to, to do that thing. You can create your self-created teaching video of some sort, which students can watch outside of class or inside class, um, but independent right. of the teacher. And one of the examples I was using for a while was... Uh, it was you teach, uh, talking through theory concepts on the iPad using not explain everything, but the other app, which is similar. Um, oh, edu creations. Edu creations, yes, yes. And okay. um, you know, I was saying to them, it doesn't matter which app; it's pick one that right. does this sort of thing. And but it was great because it shows you white screen. You draw with your finger, you know, the the, the shape of the or the notes of the scale, and you're talking through the concepts and you know, tone, tone, semitone, tone, or whatever it is. And, right. Um, but it's a great way to create videos really quickly and easily. And and yeah, the technology just allows you to do that so easily now. But yeah, right. blended learning, flipped flipped classroom. You've got a flipped classroom going on, and you didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I know that you've done uh, one of the big projects that you used to do. I, I think you've moved on from it now, you said, but um, you used to do a big holiday CD project with the students for charity. And I, I right. know that you sent me a copy of one uh, one year, which was fantastic just after that conference, I think. Um, yeah. So tell me about that. The students must have loved doing that because it's like a finished product. I think that's just a great yeah. tangible thing. So that's um, like in, in the blend, I'm sorry, in the project based learning, the idea is that you have this end product, um, some kind of a way that you share what you've done with a public. So whether it's a, a you know, a, it could be an inform, inform, informants, right? It could be a performance <laughs> where kids explain it or it could be um, a recital or it could be a, an in class where sometimes I'll invite other classes like the English teacher will bring bring their kids into my class and then we'll share what we've been doing. So we have an audience, right? So that's just a much, I call that a meta project in my book. When you do something like a CD, it actually takes you about five weeks to to do from start to finish. It's it's a very consuming, uh, so you're going to use, you're going to kill a lot of class time doing it. So, you, so it better be worth it, right? <laughs> um, and but the kids did like it, and and it, we did it for ten years. We raised tens over ten thousand. I don't know how much we we raised, um, you know, a lot of money for charities over the years that we did it. Um, but the idea was the kids would pick a uh, a holiday winter song that they would cover, and um, and then we put it on a CD. We'd sell it to the audience for a charity that they chose, and um, it just got to be that. 
the last couple of years, I felt like I was phoning it in as a teacher. It wasn't as fresh and as exciting for me. And I felt like the kids were kind of um, like CDs are just seeming too old fashioned. You know, yeah. they're all down. Who has it, it now. Yeah. <laughs> and we had put it up on the iTunes store several years, um, but it just it just seemed like that project was getting stale. And I missed the fresh, exciting, risk taking character of when we first started that the first couple of years of that project it was just a lot of fun it was very exhilarating just not even knowing if we'd meet the deadline and the kids sort of all <laughs> bought into the so anyway about a so a year ago last year um we started doing a short film festival we have a film class an elective class at parkland high school and, and each of the kids in the film class produced these short films of about five minutes each and then they gave us the uh, we didn't actually just have them give us the video we actually along the way had them come into our class and, and talk to us like actually that's happening this friday the film class is going to oh, come wow. and and pitch their treatments. So they haven't even shot a, a single frame yet, but they're going to pitch a treatment. And then I'm going to have my music producers start working on general um, mood music that'll match that. And then they're going to get together and talk about what direction the music should go, um, how the music can help tell the story and enhance their drama. Oh, and so fabulous. it'll be a collaborative, right, it's a collaborative thing that'll take about five weeks to happen maybe even longer. And then we'll have a, a film festival in our auditorium. Um, last year we had popcorn and Coke we gave to everybody for free. And we each of the filmmakers and the music producers introduced their their project to the um, uh, to the class or to the to the audience. I'm sorry, to the audience, and so they were kind of like little mini celebrities. And we had a reception afterwards, and it was a neat event. And that that to me sort of brought back that freshness and that excitement. Yeah. Um, and I think already just from last year to this year, we've made some refinements um, so that it'll even be a better project. And hopefully, we'll do this for the next ten years, and then we'll have to think of the next thing. But that's that's uh, fantastic. And are your students working individually as composers or in groups with each other? Um, Right now, from the beginning of the year until now, they've been doing both. Sometimes they'll collaborate. Sometimes one will bring in a guitar. Somebody will serve as the engineer. Somebody will serve as the talent, and they'll switch and things like that. Um, and, and we've been doing these smaller projects that ramp up to the point where they're able to, um, to you know, produce the, the music for the film. But when they actually get paired up with the filmmakers, it will mostly be one music producer and one filmmaker. Wow. Our class slightly different in size, so it may be where we end up putting two pe two music producers together with one filmmaker, or maybe two filmmakers will work on one of the same film, but they'll be like like the Coen brothers in yes. Hollywood, right? <laughs> so, like they, they may be it might be two to one or something, but it's it's roughly one to one um, uh, the way it works out. That's that's uh, a lot of pressure for the composing part of it. That, that's um, that's what I'm thinking if I had to do it, <laughs> but it'd be well, great. That's Take baby steps early in the semester, like one project that we did, you know, was just pick your favorite sound in GarageBand and then uh, record like two to four measures of you improvising. So we, we go from almost nothing to right now we're doing, I don't know if you remember the project called New Clothes for an Old Tune. Yeah, I've used it a lot. <laughs> a big file mashup. So that's what we're doing right now where they're going to generate over a minute of music um, where they're choosing a lot of, they're making a lot of musical decisions and that's a, a little bit more, you know, involved and expressive and that'll take, you know, maybe a week and a half to do. Actually, my favorite lesson we've done this year is one that I just started doing last year. Um, it's based on the idea of when kids, um, I, when I teach them how to use a microphone um, and we talk about levels, getting a sound check and all that, I ask them to bring in just found objects or if they can make any percussion sounds with their, their hands or their body. Um, so we call it found and body percussion sounds. So they record these individual, you know, maybe it's just the sound of a clapping or it's the sound of hitting a screwdriver against a filing cabinet. And they'll use a little digital signal processing, maybe take it down an octave and make it sound more like a, a boomy percussion instrument. But then um, we'll have them arrange those percussion sounds into um, two measure beats. And then we have them uh, build a longer piece by adding loops to it later. So that project produced some of the coolest sounding pieces because the different percussion sounds are so wild. And the two principles that I think I'm trying to show them, one is um, Edgar Varez, uh, the, the French uh, avant-garde composer uh, around 1900. Um, he, he, his definition uh, was kind of like a killer definition. He said it's just organized sound. And so a lot of people use that to create some pretty wild music. But, you know, if you think about it, if you record these individual events and then you organize them, you're doing kind of what Varez said. So that's the one thing. And the other principle that I'm trying to show them is that no matter how harebrained and random they, they organize the sound, as soon as they start cycling them again and again and again, as soon as they turn it into an ostinato, no matter how random, like it could be, right? it starts making it starts making sense because the, the, the principle is that repetition lends intelligibility to music. So that's Thing that comes out of that lesson and then they can throw some loops in there and anyway so that project alone was only supposed to be like maybe a 20 second thing but most of the kids took it up to like a minute or two wow. <laughs> they, they had the 
these really expressive long pieces with these bizarre percussion sounds. Um, and w w one thing that sort of framed the project is before we started it, we listened to a, a video online uh, that the artist is named Diego Sacco, and his piece is called Music from a Dry Cleaner. Uh, so you can find it on Vimeo where he... Um, he, he goes into a dry cleaner with a microphone and records all the sounds of different things in a dry cleaner. And then he makes a, a found body percussion sound piece out of that. And it's wild. It's great. So we use that at the front end of the project. And then when the project's all over, uh, we listen to a podcast that's on an NPR um, here in the States, National Public Radio, um, has a, a program called Planet Money. Yes, and I know that one. Yeah. There was a guest on that program, this music producer, his name is Illmind, I-L-L-M-I-N-D. And here he talks about, basically, he's one of these behind-the-scene guys that works with, like, Kanye and all these artists, but he creates beats for them. And he does exactly what we were doing. He just records a snare drum, or he records a bass. And and then in the podcast, he, he points out where his beats are being used by all these famous artists. Oh. So that's what, at the end of the project. So there's some neat reflection and, and listening and sort of um, self-assessment. And it's just, it, it's a good, I just love talking to the kids about that sort of aspect of music too. Yeah, I, uh, it's one of my absolute favorite projects too. I, I've been doing things like that a lot too, because I think the accessibility is so good. You don't need uh, amazing instruments. You don't need, you know, a full-blown drum machine of some sort. You just do right. body percussion sounds. And I often use Andrew Huang, who's a YouTube artist. I don't know if I ever say his name right, but he's amazing. Yeah. And um, heaps of his videos are like that. He often takes a single object and he'll make lots of sound from one object. So he'll take a saucepan, for instance, you know, a pot okay. and, and scrapes it and hits it and hits it with different things and puts the lid on and, you know, then he makes a whole beat from it. And it sounds amazing. It's the most ridiculous thing. And he, he does that where he adjusts the, the sounds that he's recorded. He might drop it or add reverb or all of these mm -hmm. things. And I say, you know, say to teachers, it's such a great way to learn those uh, music production skills kind of accidentally because you go, mm -hmm. oh, I want to do that cool thing that he did, you know, and you, then you can take it from there. But I love it so much. It's um, it's great. There, there's uh, I've been doing it on iPads a bit with MadPad in the past. Right. But MadPad's dying because of iOS 11 update, and it's right. not updating, so it's kind of gone. But um, the guy who created Loopy HD, <clears throat> he's made a new app called SampleBot, and it does that sort of thing where you can just grab tiny little samples of sound right. and put them together in a beat. Fabulous, just but fabulous. You mentioned that on a previous podcast. Yeah, I think and I, I think and I went and downloaded it right Did away. You? But my my iPad is too old it, it doesn't oh. work on the, the the generation of ipad i have is the one right before where they support that program okay so you, you, that's a reason for you to update you need to get a new ipad there <laughs> just tell, tell, tell your wife yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think we were in this weird sort of um kind of in between zone with ipads at the moment there's some apps which just don't aren't supported by the old you know right. that you can't use them on the old ones and then there's the some of the apps are dying off so we're in this weird sort of um time yeah. with our pants. I'm, I'm hoping that that all the explosion of chromebook users um has a capitalist market effect making <laughs> ipads cheaper i don't know if that'll happen but nothing would make me happier <laughs> oh my gosh that would be awesome i have to say at least there are some things uh, there were lots of things coming out which are chromebook friendly and therefore often also ipad friendly which is a kind of a good thing too i'm finding more more that it's much easier to talk about project ideas uh, using online software or websites or whatever which suit right. all devices like that's just been brilliant for me because in the past it's really hard to sort of say let's do a workshop on you know this but only iPad users can come along right. or only Mac users or only PC users so it's a yeah, lot easier. I, I was kind of disappointed uh, Google was supporting um, um, on YouTube there was a YouTube video editor and it was it looked yeah. to be like um, like iMovie Online, like a cloud version of an iMovie. And there is one or two other programs like that, but they're really awkward and clunky. They're not ready for prime time, so I don't use them. But I was actually, I started using the uh, YouTube video editor as sort of like um, if people didn't want to use Camtasia, which I think is wonderful, and we have that in our lab at, at Parkland High School, but it was like an easier way to get uh, to do some video editing. But then they they actually just discontinued it this September, oh, so there, really? there is no there is no YouTube video editor. But it was basically oh. like a cloud version of it was like what Soundtrap is to a DAW. Yeah. It was to like iMovie. Um, have, I so haven't. And I haven't used it, but um, I know some teachers are using Wii Video. I don't know if you've used right. that one at all. But that's, I th that's one of those ones that I said was awkward it's and clunky. a bit clunky. dodgy, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to mention a brand name. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. I'll, I'll take your advice on that. This episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast is brought to you by the Midnight Music Community. 
The Midnight Music Community is an online space for music teachers who'd like help using technology in their music lessons. There are online courses, video tutorials, lesson plans, music tech news, and professional development certificates are provided for any training that you undertake. I'm inside the community every day, personally answering members' questions and sharing tips and ideas. The best thing is that you get to connect with hundreds of other music teachers just like you and share your own experiences and occasional music tech frustrations. For more information and a special joining price just for the listeners of this podcast, visit midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. That's midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. For the short film uh, things that you've been doing, the projects, which, which sort of software are the students using for that? Is it whatever they feel like using and, and are they well, importing the video into, you know, Logic or GarageBand or something? It was um, either GarageBand or iMovie. And now I've sort of, um, because we're using um, Camtasia for a variety of uses, um, it, it's becoming Camtasia. Um, I'm just I'm used, having it be like my one-stop shop for yeah, um, or movie films. editing. <laughs> Projects, um, but also for creating tutorials or, and for having kids. Like last year, I had students create a video explaining how to use something using Camtasia. So um, they were sort of in the seat of having to explain it, but they were also using the software to to make these yeah. um, tutorials. So, Fabulous, uh, yeah. But the, the composers for the, the films are... They're not composing in Camtasia, obviously, because it's not a musical no, program. But, yeah, I'm sorry, you asked about that project, yes. my bad. Uh, no, that's all right. So, <laughs> <laughs> that they're using GarageBand unless they want to bring, like we always have students who might have, say, Pro Tools at home, mm. um, or they might bring their iPads into school. We're a um, bring-your-own-device school, so um, students could bring their laptop or their um, um, uh, iPad or whatever into school. So some some may. Uh, there's one or two that use Pro Tools early on, um, and I don't, I'm happy to have them do that. But I kind of make this, um, it, it sounds like a sort of an audacious statement, but early in the year, I always tell the kids, you know, there's tens of thousands of people who know how to use Pro Tools, but you don't want to listen to their music. And the reason <laughs> it's nothing to do with how they operate Pro Tools, it has everything to do with their understanding of these principles of music of lasting worth. So I don't care whether you're using GarageBand or Pro Tools, let's, um, let's make this piece unfold in a way that wants to keep the listener engaged. And that gives us something to listen to that sort of is a narrative drama that, um, that has all these principles that music of lasting worth has. You know, yeah. Give us a surprise at the ending and uh, don't just repeat something liter- literally, vary it. And repetition lends intelligibility to music and all these other uh, neat musical things. We can teach that with Pro Tools, we can teach that with Soundtrap, you know, yeah. we can teach that and whatever. And pen and paper, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, I think people get so caught up in the tool and um, I always laugh online, you'll see it everywhere on the internet, um, someone will watch a video of a someone who's very skilled at what they do and it could be anything, whether it's music or, or right. even art. My, my kids and I, we watch a lot of how to draw videos on YouTube because we're all interested in that. And there's this, yeah. um, there's this one uh, YouTuber called Draw With Jazza is his channel, Jazza, and he has a whole video on the art tools that I use, like the things I use to draw with. And he starts the video off with saying, all you need is a pencil and an eraser and paper <laughs> and then he, yeah. he, he says okay that's it really I could stop the video at this point and then he goes on to say here are all the other optional things you can need but he keeps bringing it back to but you could just use a pencil and an eraser <laughs> and they're the most that's plain okay. you know the one that you've got on your desk sort of thing nothing special <laughs> you know right. but it's it is it's true and um, I love it when I can find occasionally um, you'll come across someone who's made a video or written an article about someone who's created a fabulous track or or, you know, an album or something, and they have used GarageBand on the iPad. Yeah. There was one recently, there was a, a kid who, who uses GarageBand on his phone and he just records everything on his phone because that's what he has all the time. It's like that whole camera principle of the best camera is the one you've got in your pocket or the one right, on you at right. the time and, and that's what he does. And, and I love that because, you know, it, it doesn't matter. It's the music itself. It's not, it's not what you do, you know, which software or yeah. app you're using. So. And there are, there's some pretty big artists who, um, like I follow on Twitter and notice that they're using GarageBand uh, to, at least in the early stages of, say, sketching a tune and, Correct, and yeah. uh, doing, a, doing a, a rough kind of treatment of it and then maybe i'm sure they go into a studio and use whatever Pass the it studio on to someone is. else yeah yeah absolutely uh, but but yeah there's a lot of real creative people using that so i i think the world of garage band and, and and again what i like most about it is just that it's it's so intuitive and easy to use without a lot of instructions so we don't have to spend a lot of time on how to operate the program yeah 
because and you know I've I've presented at a lot of um, conferences where I'll play some of my students' examples, and people have actually come up to me afterwards and said, "But that wasn't done with GarageBand, though. They had to be." <laughs> I was like, why do you say that? That was done with GarageBand. Or um, even there's this one really great example. I had a student do a setting of Psalm 12. Um, and, and in the end, he did have to use Finale. But it was more because of the way he was using independent voices for the um, lyrics. Um, so in the end, we couldn't stay with Note Flight. But he did most of it. And it's a Note really Flight. cool setting. It's a great choral setting he did um, in my theory class. But he did most of it with Note Flight. And then he just had to go to Finale at, at the last minute, um, you know, exporting it as an XML and then uh, importing it. So even like some of these projects where they are using the high end, they, they started using the, the more accessible program. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a progression with it all. And yeah, I, I think get really good and try and exhaust the possibilities of the more basic version before you feel the need to get onto the more expensive one. And yeah, I think people think there's going to be some magical... Um, I don't know, some magical transformation between <laughs> using a basic right. program and moving on to this more complex one. It's well, plus, crazy. if you have Note Flight, you have it at home and at school, whereas if I you have know. Finale, unless you're willing to buy And I love Finale. That's the, that's the app I've used since 1991. I'm a big Finale fan. Um, and I do encourage kids, especially music major, uh, kids who are ed- headed towards a career in music. Yes. I try to get them over to that by the end of high school. But um, for for the the, the masses, um, I think Note Flight's a better solution. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you. I'm totally with you on it too. And um, I know that you've been using Smart Music with your band students as well. And and has that? Sure. T- tell me about the progression with you know pre technology to help you with that sort of thing. Because Smart Music, well, you tell everybody just a little bit about what Smart Music does, just for those that don't know. I mean, I know most people do. Okay. But- so actually right now there's two smart musics. There's Smart Music Classic, which is the one that we've been using for <clears throat> maybe two decades almost. Um, and then there's the um, uh, Smart Music. It's like a web or a cloud version. Yeah. The new Smart the new They're smart calling music. it the new <laughs> Smart Music, right? And that's cloud-based, um, which it looks great. And, and I, I believe that's the, uh, the direction our district, the school district in which I work, will go eventually. But right now we're using Classic. So it's a, it's a client-based or a, a program that's on our computers. And um, you can... You can show students on a. I have a um, um, a big um, whiteboard, uh, interactive whiteboard in each of my buildings where I teach instrumental music too. So I can put the the music we're playing up on the whiteboard. They can see it. They can. Uh, there's a, a little green cursor. It's actually a big green cursor. It's it's really great. In fact, today I was teaching earlier today, and when I was just having the music static on the screen and we were playing along with it, a couple of the kids are like, "Wait, I want the I want the green thing. I want the, they, they want to follow along the green thing, right?" So it, it's it's you know if they say a picture is worth a thousand or you know a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, smart music is worth ten thousand because it's not just the picture of the music. It's all these features like the cursor that helps the students track along with the music as it plays. Then when it's done playing, it shows them. Uh, Notes they played right are green. Notes they played wrong are red. Um, and it, it shows you the wrong note they played. Um, you can increase the tempo or slow down the tempo. So, for instance, with special learners, for instance, that's like my favorite thing about smart music is a special learner might not be able to play a, a song at 100 percent of the tempo right away, but they can play it at 60 percent of the tempo. So you can just slow down the tempo. And then the tracking that that uh, green cursor that tracks along with the notes is so huge for um, students with a learning disability with um, like um, reading. So the same student who might need to use their finger to actually point to the words, they're still at that stage. Well, that green cursor becomes like their finger. And I'll see it like a kid who's playing the song really well in smart music up on the screen. But then when they try to do it in their book, they fail. And it's because they don't have that cursor. Yes. So it makes a lot of stuff really accessible for special learners. Um, I just couldn't imagine teaching without it, even though I did. I mean, I used to for, <laughs> for a long time. But I've for the past 15 years, say, I've had smart music in my band rooms. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a game changer. It's, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And do, the student, do your students use it a lot independently away from school? No, that's sad. Um, so I don't know if it's the demographics of our district or just... Um, um, how infrequent, and I'm not complaining, I, I'm really proud of our district and our arts program, um, but we only have lessons once a week, whereas I know there are places in the Midwest where they have lessons every single day. Mm. And I think sometimes <laughs> those those districts, um, it's not hard to get a parent to subscribe and pay 25 bucks a year or 40 bucks a year because they're using it every day um, in school and it's it's just a great um, comp. But anyway, for, for us, I've, I've tried to turn parents on to ordering smart music. And I, I've, I have, a, a, and even though with our lesson book, we use Alfred sound innovations and y- there's a code inside the front cover of sound innovations where you can download smart music and the first 100 lines of the book are free. Oh. So even if it being free for almost all of their first year of playing, I still only get about 20, 30% of the kids that will download it at home. Wow. Um, but, you, but we do use it every single day in school. Yeah. 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 I think every it's le- great. 
And again, it's that thing of, you know, it was so different from when I was growing up when it would have been the same for you, you know, we just didn't have technology like that. It was all very much you yourself and you, you kind of had to know how the rhythms worked and, you know, I mean, I was lucky because I had parents who were music teachers so I always, always had help at hand but, yeah, it's so different nowadays. I just, I can't imagine running a band or being in a band uh, with the technology that's available because it is just so different. And right. tell me, with your book, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that and I'm I'm curious, I, I have never asked you this before, is this something, well, what was the reason for wanting to write the book in the first place? And did you sort of propose it and, and put it out there? Or was it something that you were approached to do instead? Oh, um, so what happened was I was, um, I had started presenting at different conferences. Uh, me and Jim Frankel sort of were on the same path in that we would see each other at all the same conferences. <laughs> um, he was a band director and a general music teacher in a middle school in New Jersey. And uh, here I was in Parkland School District in Allentown. And we were very involved in the, in the um, and, and I still am in, in Time, uh, Technology Institute for Music Educators. So that organization would be associated with a lot of different state music teacher conferences. And so I would go to the, you know, the Texas music to TMEA where, where yes. you presented, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I've, I've done that. Actually, I've done that four times, just not recently, um, or, or Georgia or wherever, what state I, w- I would be presenting. And so I have, I don't know whether it was New Jersey or, or Pennsylvania. It was somewhere I was presenting, um, a session called using technology to unlock musical creativity. It was the, the idea for the book, but it was just basically a session where, um, at the time, um, th- this is again, going back to like maybe 2009, uh, it seemed like less people were start. It, people were starting to wake up to the idea of student creativity, get them to create um, and project based learning, get them to do hands on applied versus um, more academic, um, you know, worksheety kind of stuff. So it was just sort of unfolding. And I felt like I was at the right place at the right time. So it, it turns out that a guy that was in the audience of, of the session, uh, his name is Norm Hershey. He's the editor at nice. Oxford University Press. So this guy comes up to me after the session's over and says, hey, do you have a minute? We can talk, buy a cup of coffee, whatever. <laughs> and so we just sat at a cup of coffee and he said, you know, Oxford University Press is starting a series of books. We want it to be sort of a music education technology themed. Um, I'd like you to be the first person in that series. Uh, wow. Do you think you could make a book out of this, uh, out of this session I just saw? And I was like, well, sure, I could try. So I went home and basically um, they have a very involved, um, like you have to pitch your book to them. You have to, write a, you have to write a sample chapter or two and you have to write an outline of the whole book. So it took me a while, but I sent it into them. And then they have some uh, blind, um, you know, uh, juried kind of thing where, where different, I think there were college teachers um, uh, gave some feedback and said, oh, this, you know, this is good, but why doesn't he do this, that kind of thing. And so they accepted it. And, and basically by 2011, it was released. So it was really just because I happened to be presenting and Norm saw it and, and Oxford was starting their series. And wow. Barnes was the sec- second book in that series, by yes, the way. Yes, yes. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. Because I know that that's a fairly standard thing, isn't it, with the, the whole, like if you were cold pitching a book, you would do the same sort of thing. You'd have a sort of a proposal and you'd write a couple of sample chapters and stuff. So, right. Yeah, so that, that's really fascinating. That's like every author's dream, to just have someone come up to you and say, do you want to write a book? <laughs> I, and, after, I, and I never even saw myself as an author. No, no. Um, <laughs> I'm a creator. I, I compose a lot, but I had never actually. I had um, I, I had I had been I'd served as an editor on a book that Time produced, um, and I'd written a chapter for that book. And I yeah, you know, I'd written some articles, and I was a radic- um, I, I was a regular writer for um, there was a music technology magazine, uh, Music Ed Technology, and I was a regular feature writer for them for a while. But they went out of business. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just never really thought of myself as a book author until Norm asked me about it, and um, and it was it was very much like writing a, a, a dissertation. It was a lot of work, and yeah. Um, yeah. Tell, tell, and how long was it? How long was the process from start to finish, roughly? I think it took me about two years to get the book from the from me pitching, sending in their proposal uh, mm. format, and then um, writing the book. And then the editing process takes a long time, you know, back and forth, where they um, you send in a word document, and then then they. Um, uh, you give you some things to change, then you um, they set, typeset it in like PDFs and, and send you that, and those are called galley proofs, and then you have to edit. Anyway, it took a long time yeah. uh, to get it uh, right. And, and to actually, you, to you two- doesn't surprise me at all. I, I, I would say that's <laughs> fairly normal. <laughs> Show you how hard it was and, and how affected I was by it. I'm so glad I did it. It was the mo- one of the most rewarding things I've done professionally. But 
two years ago, Norm asked me to start writing the second edition of that book, <laughs> which I had tried to, to do, but I just could not fit it in. My, I still, he ever, about every six months, he emails me and says, I'm not rushing you, but anytime <laughs> you want, we're ready for the second edition. And, and I just have had, I haven't had the time. Um, and I want to, I will definitely do it, but it's, um, yeah, I was going to, I was actually going to ask you about that. And I had wondered that about Barb's book too, um, about new editions. Cause this is the thing that, you know, I always struggle with mentally, uh, with technology books as soon as it's published almost it's out of right. date again you know with the technology yep. but but yours and Barb's are both um although they mention software it's not heavily you know screenshots right. of where to click and all that sort of stuff it's more about the, the music approach the the compositional and that was and very ideas. deliberate yeah and, and that's and what i would still, do too <laughs> yeah but and even still though i'll read a page like i actually use it to, i teach as an adjunct in a, at a philadelphia area university and and so it's a monday night class and i'll we'll be going over it and i'll look at a certain page and think now that looks dated you know like <laughs> yeah. like like i nudge um even though there's oh, another program i found so to replace that, that one yeah yeah, yeah which, I know. which one do you use to replace I, I just use tone, tone matrix, tone matrix um, yeah and i just that's layers like no, like i know, layers I know, but. I know. and tone matrix i have big issues with it every time i show it at a conference a presentation or a workshop if the room depending on the lighting of the room you actually cannot see it on the oh, <laughs> no. projector because it's all black with a black yeah. background and and sometimes it just looks like a black screen and i, I say to everyone just when I click in a moment, you'll see that there's like a grid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah that I was, was sad. Program. I wish oh, they didn't. Yeah. And there's a few that have died and I've been really sad about. Um, the other one that I loved, um, do you remember Avery? I think Avery might have been the company. They had, um, oh, what on earth was it called? It was like an online kind of drum sequencer thing and – it had the blue – anyway, it died as well, and it was fabulous, and it had some options which were melodic options too, so you could build yeah. up um, like that a drum sequence. definitely ring the bell. I can't remember. It was almost like a DAW, but it was yeah, more like a drum. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. A, a, and there, there was exporting options. It had everything, and I thought if if yeah. someone wanted me to create an app, that would be the one I would do, but there's other things around now anyway, so it's not right. too bad. Yeah, I think the, the book writing thing, it's such a great thing once it's done, but um, you know, I've gone through the process too, and – you know, it, it's like I, I love writing and I love I love sort of explaining things, whether it's in writing right. or a tutorial video. But, man, you just I feel like I'm like until it's done. Right. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, it was, you know, such a hard, hard thing to I do. Know. Such a hard thing to do. And I find myself yep. procrastinating. And, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I hear you. you're yep. in that mode with Norm, aren't you? <laughs> So Norm is listening. I am thinking about it, Norm. <laughs> I've actually I started a Google Doc. I have all these different things I want to put into it, but it's it's just a ways off. And and the thing, the coolest thing is I've I've added like there's 30 lessons in the original. There's 29 in the original book. There's 29 example lessons, and I probably have another 29 lessons since yeah. then. That, like the one I described with the uh, found and body percussions that I think are cool lessons that I think people might um, be able to use. By the way, most of those lessons are actually on my website. So if people go to the, uh, my Parkland yes, Music Wiki, and I'll, they can I'll find link them. To that. Yeah, I'll link to that because there's so much information on that that wiki. Scott, I mean, you've right. had that for years now, I think, yeah. and I've referred lots of people to that. So I'll link to that and everything else. I'll link to the book too. But um, right. yeah, it's just it's just great. And, and that's the other thing I find, you know, you put something together and you're like, uh, as soon as it's published, you're like, oh. Now, I don't do it like that anymore, or I've changed right. my or approach, you, or I've added this in. Your, yeah, yeah. yeah you and and I think that's maybe maybe how I should open up the second edition of the book, is saying, you know, one of the, the tenets of project-based learning is that uh, by students refining, they keep improving, and it keeps raising the level higher, higher, higher. And this book is an example of that. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I got a lot of stuff right, but here's something that's even better, right? So um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. Yeah, yeah, definitely do that. And um, tell me, just I wanted to talk a little bit about being a published composer as well, because I think to me it's something that I find interesting, and I'm sure that people listening would also be curious if they do any compositional work. I mean, you've had a lot of works published. I think you said over 70 now. So yep. when, when was the time that you first had one like officially published with a real publisher? Okay. <laughs> So I think the story I'm going to tell you is actually a story about um, being entrepreneurial, which is bigger than just composing. It's it's uh, all the things we're talking about. But um, so it was 1998. And um, for, for Christmas, my wife is a very fine flutist. So for Christmas, I actually wrote her 
um, I did these five settings of um, English carols, like the Holly and the Ivy, oh, nice. um, or, or, or Coventry Carol. But I did them in a really con- kind of contemporary, unique setting. So I called them Five Carols for Flute and Piano. And, I, and this is back before I was using Finale. It was on that onion skin paper with the India ink that you had to <laughs> like, use. A, so I copied it out by hand for Kim and had it produced at the Free Library of Philadelphia, where they had the, the, the machinery that produced that kind of stuff. It looked like the old Broadway books used to look. Yes. Um, anyway. So I presented that to Kim for Christmas in 1998, and that was a gift for her, right? But um, I was really proud of those carols. I thought they were really unique settings, and Kim liked playing them. She played them at a lot of places, at our church, at old age homes. She, she just used them a lot. And so um, I just got this idea. I wonder if people would be interested in buying them. So I took out ads in two different music journals, um, <laughs> like the, the, the national one and, and our state, Pennsylvania, um, the Music Educator Journal, just a little like one-inch ad that said contemporary flute settings, Christmas, traditional Christmas carols or something like that. And I sold like, I don't know, 150 of them. Oh <laughs> I mean, basically gosh. people would send me 15 or 18 or 20. I forget what I charged for them, but they, and I would mail each one out, you know, by hand. So after I had done that, yeah. I thought, you know, um, there's a magazine called flute world magazine. It's, <laughs> it's actually for flute players. And my <laughs> wife used to get it. So I wrote to, or no, I, yeah, I wrote or called up. I forget how, somehow I got in touch with the editor of that magazine and said, Hey, um, and this was, by the way, a year late. So I gave it to her in Christmas, and this was maybe by the next September. So I, I said, Christmas is right around the corner. Would you consider, um, like, I'll give you permission to put one of these carols for free in your magazine. So you could have that as a gift, a Christmas gift to your to your listener, to your readers. Um, put one of my carols in your flute magazine. All I ask, you don't have to pay me for it. All I ask is that you just say, here's how you can order it. And then I got dozens of more orders. <laughs> so so after I like sold like 200 copies or whatever it was, I don't forget what it was, but I, I, I actually started thinking, you know, maybe this should be published. So then I, I looked all over the place for publishers who produce chamber music, not, you know, big band publishers like Alfred. I tried to find the right fit for that piece. And I found a publisher uh, at the time. They're up in Vermont. Now they're down in Florida. But they're called Trilenium Music Company. And the guy actually, um, so in, in my letter to him saying, would you consider publishing this? I said, I already just sold 200 copies just by taking out an ad <laughs> in a magazine. And I think he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it so actually has been one of his best-selling pieces. So he ended up publishing it. And he actually asked me, well, you only did five. Could you do five more? So I wrote a second piece, which is called, not very creatively, Five more carols, <laughs> and, <piano. laughs> and that also sold pretty well for them. Wow. So, like that, that was, and, and the same thing happened with Alfred. Um, we, we we had um, invited John O'Reilly, who's the author of the the music, the the book that we used for our first and second year band students. Um, it was his name is John O'Reilly. He was at the time the concert band editor for Alfred. We invited him to Parkland to show us how to use the book that he had written, and he spent the day with us. And we went out to lunch, and when we were talking. It just turned out we had a lot in common. He had taught college theory, but he was a school band director. Um, John Kenyon, who was a very influential music ed composer, had had sort of taken him under his wing and got him published and said, yeah, you, you, you know what the ranges are for these student level pieces and all that. So anyway, he said, you know, Scott, you'd probably be really good at writing for education. Why don't you send me a piece? And uh, the piece I sent him was called Walkin' Cool. <laughs> and it was like, it was like a grade one piece that I had already posted on my website. I had a website at the time called Home Practice Online. And anything that I had my students play that I wrote, I would actually put PDFs of all the parts and the score and um, recordings. And other band directors could download it. So I knew that dozens of other band directors had already played this piece and really liked it. My kids loved it. They thought it was their favorite piece. I sent it to John and said, um, hey, um, here's the piece I, I, I'm going to send you, Walking Cool. So three weeks later, he said, you know, we're going to pass. We, we're, we're not interested in it. Oh. It just it seems like it's an okay piece, but um, we're not interested in it. So that was that, right? Except for uh, in a, a rare move, moment of me not being kind of shy about it, I called him up about a week later and said, John, who, who's this? Scott Watson. <laughs> oh, oh, Scott. Okay. You know, like he barely knew me, really. And I said, well, you know, remember that piece, Walking Cool? And I said, I know you turned it down, but is there any chance you could just reconsider? Just think about it, because I'll tell you what, all these other band directors that have performed it told me their kids loved it, and my kids loved it. They thought it was their favorite piece we did this year. I think it would really work well for you guys. So he said, well, I'll go back to the editors, and we'll talk about it. So then he called me back and said, you know what? We're going to take a chance. We'll publish it. Um, so they published it. It ended up being their bestseller that year. Oh, <laughs> my gosh. Copies in the first year or whatever. And um, That's so awesome. Yeah, I, I think of those, because uh, honestly, this might be very hard to believe after the last 15 minutes of me talking about myself, <laughs> but there, 
a time where I was much more um, uh, reticent to, to, to be forward about things like that. And I just had to learn that um, a lot of these things involve you being relational, right? Being, being kind to other people and making connections. And, um, and then sometimes being entrepreneurial, like thinking of that thing like the flute magazine publishing, yeah. like, you know, you have to sort of think out of the box. Um, you you totally do. And, and that's actually one of the reasons I started this podcast, I have to say, is because I knew that it would um, allow me to make contact with a lot of people from around the world and obviously raise profile and that sort of thing. But, I mean, I love doing it anyway, <laughs> regardless mm-hmm. of all of those things. But right. there is an element of, of needing to connect with people and building those relationships. And something like a podcast or having, you know, videos on YouTube. I know, I know some teachers have created just – on a whim, created some kind of video. Like, I I can't remember his name, but there's a music educator. I know he's in this big Facebook group of music teachers and um, I feel like his surname is Barrow and I'm sorry, I'll I'll link to the video that I'm about to mention, but he created a video um, which Barb uses a lot in her classes and it's about uh, identifying where C is on the keyboard and Uh it's called C is to the left of the two black keys. I think that's what the name, (laughs) and it's the most annoying, irritating jingle sort of song But my gosh, the students will never forget where how to find right. C on the keyboard. Yes. And, you know, I think he's become known for that. I think he posted recently, like, unfortunately, this is my legacy. <laughs> <You> know, <this laughs> is, I'm now known mostly for this video. But, but it's great. And just putting stuff out there is, is sure. definitely the way to go. And I think um, getting back to that, that idea of just putting the ad out for the flute pieces, mm-hmm. uh, in the online marketing world, there's this concept of a minimum viable product where, you know, you put something together, which is what your customers want, you know, in this case, Mm -hmm. other flute players or band directors or whatever it is. And you put something together and you put it out there and you see whether it will sell. And so, I mean, you've done this without even realizing it. You've put together your minimum viable product. You don't even know. I didn't know the jargon. (laughs) (laughs) You've put it together. You've tested the market by just, you know, in a couple of places and then, it's so much easier than to take it to a publisher, like you said. Hey, I've got a proven track record here mm-hmm. of two hundred, you know, copies are sold or, or whatever it is, and and the same with the other things. So, so yep. it, and that that for the walking cool piece was that? Yeah. Did you say that was with Alfred? Was that with Alfred yes, publishing? That yes, was, that was and, my first piece and that with was Alfred. The now, start I, of the relationship. I, I don't want to. <laughs> in, in full disclosure, I will tell you, I've had some real bombs with Alfred too. So when <laughs> when Don O'Reilly left Alfred, uh, Robert Sheldon took over as the concert band editor. Who's they're both great men, and and, and I have so much that I owe. Them, uh, and I'm thankful to them. But anyway, the first piece that Bob accepted of mine was called Aesop's Fables, and it was a grade five. It's a very hard, it was actually a commission for a wind ensemble, a, high, uh, a college wind ensemble. And I'm actually very proud of the piece. When I said it to Bob, he liked the piece. He even said, I wish I had written this myself. I love it. <laughs> it was a total bomb. Nobody bought it, and nobody has bought it. Mean, it's, I think it's sold in nine years, like maybe 80 copies. <laughs> so it, it hasn't actually done very well for them. So what consequently happened is Alfred wouldn't publish any of my upper level pieces for a couple of years. And then when they finally did, luckily I had some ones that worked out well. Uh-huh. So um, the, the, what worked for me with Walking Cool and young band music, the opposite worked for me with older music. And now that's starting to turn around, thank God. But but yeah, it's uh, it's, it's just one of those things. It must be really hard. And um, just getting back to like technology use, how do you, when you send pieces off to, to Alfred or whichever publisher it is, are you right. sending them uh, a finale file at that point? Uh, you've already put it together to some extent right. so in I- finale. And then they, I'm presuming they go through an edit and, and you know, right. make it look like their house style and all that sort of stuff. So. I'll, I'll send the score to them as a finale. Um, actually, I send them a PDF. Uh, at first, they weren't even interested in the finale file. Now their engravers actually use our finale files, and they must have a way of importing the note information, but still keeping like all the their things about yeah. their image. Right. Um, but at first, all they wanted was a PDF. But I you know, had to look professional, because if you're going to share a yeah. piece, you, you can't have a hokey looking score. It has to look really, really good. <laughs> And I'm pretty good with Finale, but their engravers are better. So they, they start all over again and, and make it look great. But they, you also have to send a uh, some kind of an audio mock-up or an actual recording. So unless you have a darn good band that sounds amazing, you should always send an electronic realization yeah. that sounds amazing. Yeah. And so I'll use <laughs> character sounds and things like that. Sometimes if Finale won't give me, like, there's things like gong hits and suspended cymbal rolls that yeah, I just not happy. Yeah, it substitutes actually, something dodgy, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'll export the um, the, the um, audio file from Finale, drop that in a track of GarageBand, set up a mic and record my cymbal roll myself. Oh, or record. Excellent. 
so that everything sounds really good so that nobody's hearing anything bad. And I have to say, well, just imagine if a good player was playing yes. this or just yes. imagine if it was, you know, you don't want to be in that situation because they're very busy, you know, and so try to make it sound as professional as you can. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's that's really interesting that they wanted a PDF early on. I know, I know in um, Sibelius, is a, um, most people will know that, but yeah, you can sort of click a button to say, apply this house style essentially or import this house style and apply it to the score. Right. But, but sometimes the way people have set things up in finale at their end, i.e. the composer, is not always the best way or in Sibelius, it's not always the best way. And so I can understand also why they might want to start from scratch. As, mm-hmm. as a copyist for many years, um, not, let's just say not every composer shares the same values of, of you sending an, a really good looking <laughs> score through. That is not the case yeah. for many people. And as a copy, right. as a copy, as you sort of sit there going, what on earth do they mean at this point? Mm-hmm. You know, and you'll get weird things like dynamics, um, like a, like a crescendo, you know, hairpin crescendo. It will start at uh, MF and it will crescendo and end at MF. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think they meant that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, well, they, yeah. Thank, it's, it's, yeah, thank God there's uh, editors. So when yeah. I send in a piece, the, the editor looks at it. They also have a um, copyist who looks at it. And I think there's even a third um, um, person who looks at it. And um, between us all, we hopefully catch those things. Catch, yeah. And there's always still something that will slip through and right. inevitably, but that's, that's just the way it is. Excellent. Yeah. And uh, just to finish, tell me, do you do non something non-technology related to relax and to have some downtime? Yes, I do. Um, so I, I bike a little bit, but not so much as I'm getting older. That's morphing into more walking. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I don't have the, the wherewithal to make it up the hills anymore. Uh, so I, I like to go on walks. And I like to, when I'm on those walks, I like to listen to podcasts oh, good. <laughs> like, like yours and, and some other really cool podcasts that are out there. Um, and I like to read a lot. I'm, I'm a pretty voracious reader, which is really funny because when I was in school, when I was you know, up through high school, I, you know, I would not touch a book. I just wasn't into that. Really? But for whatever reason, um, I'm a big fan of biographies, especially nonfiction. I don't really read very much uh, fiction. Yeah. Why, why did it change? At what point did it change from you not wanting to read to wanting to read? Was there some book that triggered that, that change? <sighs> Not really. Um, I mean, maybe there was, and it's been so long because it, it's been pretty, you know, it's been a couple of decades now that I've been an avid reader. Um, and I like sort of connecting the dots historically. So, you know, if there's some period of time that you're not really, you know, clear on, you know, t- read a book about it and that'll like connect the dots for you. Yeah. Um, My dad's a massive of- historical, you know, he, he loves history too. And, um, you know, when you go to someone's house and in the bathroom, you know, if you've got to be in the bathroom for a while, there might be some magazines to <laughs> read. My dad has like a massive hardback book which is titled World War Two or something like that. Yeah. I'm like, oh dad. Actually he's morphed into using um his iPhone now. He reads everything on his iPhone. So he loves it because uh, everywhere he goes he has a book and we used to have right. this joke growing up about we would set out as a family on some excursion to, you know, the shops or, or whatever it was. And right. he'd say, should I bring a book? Because he never wanted, you know, he just didn't want to come into the shops. He would sit in the car right. and wait for us. But should I bring a book? Like, how long are we going to be? <laughs> but now yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't matter because he's always got his book with him because it's on his phone. So, um, well, I feel sorry for my, my students, <laughs> my family. Like when I get into a book that I really like, I have to share the stories yeah. with them about what I'm learning. And, um, and I guess it's the teacher of me. So I really, even though this is what I do for leisure um like i can't help but bring the lessons of, of the book yeah. i'm reading and just tell my students um whatever yeah i hear so, you i hear you i'm the yeah. same too <laughs> it's when you're enthusiastic for, about for it. instance yeah. <laughs> <laughs> seriously I, I just read a book on the wright brothers okay oh really so, yeah the orville and, and uh, wilbur wright the, the the first flyers and um like i i, I learned this fun fact and I'll, I'll i could tell you 10 more of these fun facts but i won't i won't I won't be that boorish person, but I'll tell you one. Um, at the same time as they were developing their flyer, uh, the head of the Smithsonian Institute, which was like at the time our big science institute, um, he was also developing an aircraft. He had $70,000 in government money behind him. The Wright brothers had $1,000 of their own money. Wow. Guess who's Guess whose plane worked? Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's fascinating. So, like you learn these things like, man, it doesn't really matter about throwing money at a problem. Exactly. It's that these guys are, um, in the book, there was somebody who called them, I guess it was the jargon of the time. They called these two boys the workingest fellows they had ever met. <laughs> like they were 
super hardworking, grit, you know, creative problem solvers. And that was what made the difference. Yeah. And that comes back to that technology thing, you know, it doesn't matter about the software, it just, you know, it's, it's the skill and it's what you put into it. So there you go. Thank yeah. you so much for chatting today. It's been great. Oh, chatting, there's that word. We, we laughed before we <laughs> pressed record. <laughs> Scott Steve's You'll never be able to say that chat. again. I know, I'm going to have to say talking with. <laughs> talking with. <laughs> Apparently it's a funny Australian thing. <laughs> It's like Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way. It sounds great. <laughs> I need to widen my repertoire, clearly. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan, so thank you for having me, Katie. No, no problem at all. I'll hopefully see you sometime soon. I will be at Texas next year, so I don't know if you're going to planning to be there as well. Maybe not. <laughs> but, um, maybe not. Yeah, well, Just maybe you should, the... yeah, you should come. I can only get so many days off from my teaching, and there's – there's the other conferences and guest conducting that sort of, I'd like to go back there. That is one of my favorite conferences, though. It's crazy big. It's crazy big. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been great talking. All right. All the best, Katie. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 36. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.